Okay, so let's talk about Python and network automation. That's a hot topic, of course, today in modern networking, and there's a lot of confusion about what Python and network automation, how it all works together. So let's start out with the concept of network automation. Now, for the past 20 years or so, whenever we have a device, such as a router, we've gone in via CLI, such as the uh, iOS style CLI from Cisco or, or whatever vendor, and we've gone and configured it by hand. So we've had a we've had kind of a problem in terms of automating that configuration. So let's say we wanted to turn on an interface. So that requires a no shut command. If we want to give it an IP address, IP address at ten one 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 two fifty five two fifty five so this is standard iOS. Uh, a few other attributes or whatever, and we'd go in and, and type it in by hand. But what if we wanted to automate that? What if we wanted to kick off an automated process and do this? Well, there were two kind of primary methods of doing this. One was it was supposed to be SNMP. We were supposed to be able to use SNMP as sort of a universal protocol to configure devices. Now, for the most part, SNMP gets only used for two things. One, for monitoring by pulling stats such as interface statistics, uh, and two, for alerts. So if something goes on, the, uh, the, the router or switch or whatever can send an SNMP trap. But originally what SNMP was designed for was more than that. It was designed to be able to, for you to be able to, to provide some credentials, make an SNMP call to a device and configure things like interfaces and it was meant to be an automation method. Most vendors um, do not implement uh, that kind of read-write control through SNMP anymore. Some vendors have at one point, but for the most part, read-write is not, uh, not a viable option for configuration. The alternative that we had was something known generally as screen scraping. So that's where you write a script that pretends to be an interactive user, pretends to log into the CLI, waits for the login prompt, passes in the login information, waits for the password prompt, passes the password, um, waits for the shell prompt, types in commands, and basically pretends to be an interactive user. That has a couple of problems. <clears throat> One, um, depending on... Um, when, you, when you're giving commands, you're waiting for a response, you're giving commands, you're waiting for a response. If the code changes, perhaps we've got a different responses or a scripts break. We don't have a real good a way to verify that the changes we made were actually put in place. Um, just the back and forth CLI just wasn't meant to be, um, to be automated. It's also very difficult to parse. So, for example, if you did a show run to verify, how are you going to determine which is the, the IP address in a, in a you know, show run interface? Uh, well, okay, we got four octets. Well, if you've ever used something called regular expressions, you know that um, parsing can be quite difficult and, and can be quite tricky. And if any little bit of behavior changes in the command line, which it can from version to version, you, all of your scripts are broken. So... It really wasn't a good way to do it, so we just haven't had much in, the, in terms of automation. Until recently, we've uh, most of the vendors, including Cisco, Arista, Juniper, uh, Arista was, was quite early in it, but, but the, all the other vendors were, are, are implementing this, is a REST-based API. So what is a REST-based API? Um, it fixes a lot of the problems that we had in SNMP. Um, one of the big problems with SNMP was security, um, and it still is. So even though we're using SNMP version 3 for a lot of places, and that does provide encryption, it provides um, a, a problematic encryption. Whereas a REST API uses just the HTTP protocol. So HTTP as a protocol is very well known. And then we use the TLS wrapper, colloquially known as the SSL library, but it's uh, really TLS, so that we can swap out ciphers and hashes. Ciphers being the uh, symmetric encryption, hashes being the asymmetric. In SNMP, the cipher and hashes are specified actually in the version 3, so that means um, that if the cyber, one of the ciphers or hashes uh, was deprecated, then we have to actually change the SNMP standard, which is exactly what happened. SNMP version 3 uses the SHA-1 family 
of hashes, and that has been deprecated since I think 2012. So we um, most version most implementations of SMP version three are using a weak hash. There is an RFC to fix it, but a lot of vendors haven't implemented that particular RFC yet. So um, also a, a, another problem with SNMP was the OIDs and the MIB file. So if you ever take a look at a MIB file, um, you're in for um, what's the opposite of a treat? It's it's a maddening maze of of whatever. And an OID is something like it's an address uh, 1.3.1.9.1.3, something like that. And that gives you something like CPU uh, utilization. So you can pull things. You can also set things. So you can do a get. You can do a set. Um, Finding out, translating an OID, which is what you need for automation or even just uh, monitoring, pulling that from a MIB file is very problematic. You can't just read the MIB file. The MIB files are um, they're nested and they're not parsed, um, if that makes any sense. Uh, just take a look at a MIB file and you'll see what I mean. Nowhere in a MIB file will you see a full address. So you have to, you have to follow, you have to collapse the MIB file. Basically, you have to load it into a MIB compiler in order to read the MIB file. And that just, it just makes it, it just, in my opinion, um, you know, who am I? But in my opinion, the MIB files um, were, were really poorly designed. Um, it makes it very difficult to find that information. So back to, Asana, back to REST APIs. So REST APIs uses HTTP. HTTP is, um, is a protocol we've been using for, since the 90s. And it's very good at doing uh, a couple of simple things, um, and that's CRUD. So CRUD is create, read, update, and delete. So if you think about it, whenever we're doing configurations on a device, we're either creating a new configuration, we're reading a configuration that we just did, we're updating an existing configuration, or we're deleting a, 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 an existing configuration. So REST APIs which are a subset of SOAP, service-oriented uh, architecture protocol, um, sits on top of a network device, or any type of device really, but in networking we're, we sit on top of a router, and it acts like a receiver, uh, just like SNMP does, and is waiting for commands. So you give it credentials, and that's then again through HTTP, through a number of methods, and you can issue it commands. And one of the great things about the REST API, is that when you issue a command, you're going to get a response. And that response is going to be something like 200 OK. So if you know that from HTTP, 200 OK might indicate that the change that we made was been, has been implemented. We might get a 400 error. 404 means the object that we've been trying to configure is not found. Um, it might be like V1 slash V1 in, in a... In a REST API is the version of the API. Um, V1 slash interfaces slash module one slash uh, interface one uh, dot 100 for VLAN 100. And if we try to do a configuration and maybe there's not a line card in slot one, um, we'll get a 404 not found error, something like that. It doesn't have to be that way. And, and I didn't actually specify a specific REST API that I know of. I'm just using an example here. So it's waiting for your commands. You give it some credentials. You can throw commands at it. Um, we can use HTTPS to encrypt it. And we can do things like HP auth. We can do tokens. Uh, we can do uh, uh, client certificates for SSL. So there's a lot of different ways we can we can do this very securely. And um, the vendors of most of the vendors are implementing REST APIs in just about every every corner of their uh, product line, and um, it allows for very easy automation. Which brings us to Python. So, what is Python's role in this? So, Python is known as a scripting language, um, and it runs the Python interpreter. So. Um, it's different than programming with like C programming. C programming is fairly low level and involves managing memory and pointers and so forth. Python doesn't do any of that. Also static typing we have um, in C. For example, if in C, I, we have to do integer I. So now I can only be an integer, like one. I cannot be hello because we are statically typing the, the variable. Well, we don't have to worry about that in Python. So in one minute, I can be one, and then the next minute we can 
we can change the uh, variable i to be hello. And the interpreter doesn't complain. It takes care of all that for us. So what is Python? Python is a programming language, or scripting language, uh, to be more specific, but it's considered a programming language. It's similar to, it's on the same level roughly as, as Perl, as PHP, as uh, TCL, uh, Tickle. Um, uh, so it's it's very similar to those in, in that it's an interpreted language, a scripting language. So, uh, we don't use a compiler, we use a, an interpreter. And why Python for network? Uh, another, um, another common scripting language is Ruby. Um, so why Python? Why not Ruby or why not Perl or why not uh, whatever? And um, honestly, I, I can give you a good answer. Um, in terms of network automation, you're not required to use Python. You can use whatever language you want. However, it just seems to be that the critical mass of vendors and developers and um, engineers who have written scripts and, po and published them on public repositories such as GitHub have gravitated towards Python as sort of the de facto um, scripting language for, for network automation. To a lesser extent, another popular one is Golang, the Go language, and that is uh, a little bit more complex. The learning curve for that one's uh, a little bit higher than Python, but certainly not um, not above any. If you're capable of being a network engineer, you're you're capable of of learning these languages. So Python, it's a scripting language, and in any kind of script, it's just a simple. We're giving a we're we've got a script and we're giving it a set of tasks. We're assigning, var assigning variables, we're calling functions, and it's just a set of tasks, like task number one, log in to switch. Task uh, number two is uh, configure a new VLAN. Task number three is assign IP address. So it's not it's not rocket science here. It's, it's, pretty, just, it's pretty easy. It's just a step-by-step -step instructions on what to do. And um, there's plenty of resources out there to learn Python. Um, so how does that relate to network automation? And how does that relate to, uh, to APIs? Now, um, the login, configure, assign IP, all of that, that has to be, we have to craft API calls, a REST API call. So uh, for example, um, configuring, uh, so login means we need to provide credentials. Uh, we could do... HTTP auth, so that means the username and password for uh, a device is going to be in the actual HTTP header. Now, if you use HTTPS, then um, then we don't have to worry about uh, being snooped. Um, but uh, there's also other ways you can use a token, um, which is similar to uh, it's basically a cookie that is used for authorization, or we can use client certificate. But anyway, we have to figure some way to do the actual login. So, um, and we have to formulate, we have to craft an HTTP call. Now, in order to send it to, here's our little router here, so that we can send API calls to the router and then verify that the, whatever we did has been completed. So that's what, a, that's what the Python scripts does. Now, where do we run these Python scripts? Well, we run them from, we can run them from any place. Now, a lot of the network devices actually have a Python interpreter built into them. So, for example, Cisco Nexus switches, um, like the Nexus 9Ks, there's actually a Python interpreter running on them. So, the same thing with Arista. And um, so, you can actually run Python scripts right on the router. But for an automation perspective, we typically don't run those scripts directly on the routers and switches because... We're going to, uh, this will be a switch. We're gonna do it from a single unified place. For example, orchestration. So we're gonna run it from perhaps a Linux box, maybe just a Linux VM that we have running that's a centralized location where we put all of our, our, our Python um, automation scripts or, or whatever language that we're using. So the script is going to, we're gonna to have to craft a an HTTP message that we can send to these routers or switches or whatever. And in crafting the HTTP message, we've got uh, a header and any HTTP request, and then we've got a payload. The payload is going to have the information such as what VLAN, what IP address, 
what interface uh, options are we going to do auto negotiate are we going to um, use uh, auto negotiate the speed or we're going to hard set the speed or whatever and we can encapsulate that we can encode that data we can structure that data in a couple of different ways the common ways are we can use um, uh, JSON which uh, or we can use XML XML has been around for a little bit longer I believe um, but JSON works just as well. JSON's a little bit easier to read, um, but you can certainly use XML. Um, doesn't really matter. Most REST API implementations will support both. Um, so check with your vendor. And uh, we can encode it in there. And, you know, if it's XML, it might look like IP adder. And then 10, 1, 1, 1. And then terminate the IP adder. Just you know examples, so that'll be in the in the payload. The header is going to be uh, part of the the get request will be version one slash uh, module one for the first line card. And like I said before, interface one uh, slash one hundred for VLAN one hundred, or it could be just slash one, and then we put the VLAN in the XML. It, again, it depends. All the vendors have specifications for their um, for their APIs and how to craft these these HTTP messages. And um, so we craft the message and then we throw it at the at the device. And it'll will of course search and replace and or not search and replace, but we'll use um, variables to fill in fill in things like IP addresses and VLANs and whatnot. So again, a Python script is just a set of tasks. Now, most of the time, we're actually not going to have to do that work right there and craft the payload because that work's already been done through us via libraries. So what is a library? In, um, in programming, a library is a collection of functions, a collection of things that we've, we've already um, done before. Someone's done the work, and so that way we don't have to, we don't have to actually make a um, we don't have to craft a, an HTTP message. We can just call a function. A function will look like something like this. So, add underscore VLAN. Maybe that's our function, and then we'll pass the function some variables such as um, module one will be the first variable we pass. The second variable will be v the VLAN ID. So VLAN one hundred. The third variable will be the subnet mask. Hopefully get rid of my writing here. And then that's it. Someone has already created this function for us and we just call it and we just send the command. Um, we'll typically pull the results. So once we do this, it's gonna return an HTTP code. So um, we can do print result. And if it's, um, comes back as 200 that we know that our command was successful. So so we don't even have to worry about XML and JSON and all that. Most vendors, Cisco, Arista, etc., have pre-made pre that you can download and use um, Python libraries and perhaps other languages as well that have these functions already crafted. So you just call them, just make references to them in your scripts so that all the payload um, has already been has already been done. So you don't even have to worry about the actual HTTP specification or have to worry about the um, API specification. You just send it. All you need is the credentials and the libraries and you just call those functions. So um, I hope that helps clear up some of the confusion. That, that was a very high level uh, description of network automation using Python and um, REST APIs. So uh, certainly uh, all of these subjects can be gone into at a much deeper level. Um, and uh, I, I do classes that, that do this, of course. And um, But this was a very high level, so I hope this uh, clears some stuff up. You can find me on Twitter. Again, my name is, uh, I think I mentioned it before, but my name is Tony Burke. You can find me at tburke, um, and I blog at datacenteroverlords.com. Thank you for watching.